Welcome. This is Music to My Ears. My name is Carl Herzer. I'm the associate conductor with the Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra. And today we're going to talk about Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, the Pastoral Symphony. I love this piece. And in my opinion, out of all of Beethoven's works, it offers to the listener a sense more so than the rest of solace, of comfort, of being at peace with oneself and the world around. I also like to call this piece sometimes Beethoven's Quiet Revolution. When we think of the symphonies or the symphonic works that really made a huge impact and changed the game for what people thought a symphony could be, we often think of Eroica, the third symphony, we think of the fifth symphony and his ninth and final symphony, of course. But in the sixth, in the pastoral, he sets out to achieve a number of things in a subtle way that would have a huge impact on subsequent generations uh, and composing styles throughout the rest of the 19th century. Some things even that wouldn't become commonplace until the 20th century. The most noteworthy thing about Beethoven's VI that is often talked about is the fact that it's really the first undeniably programmatic symphony. Program music means that the music is trying to convey a sense of something that already exists in the world, whether it's something in the natural world like Beethoven does in this symphony, or a painting, or maybe a historical figure, a poem, or uh, a foreign country brimming with the excitement of exoticism. This is music that tries to convey something other than the music itself. And composers like Hector Berlioz and Franz Liszt would really take this idea and run with it throughout the rest of the 19th century. Not only does Beethoven call this piece the Pastoral Symphony, which already puts in our minds an idea, uh, a vision of, of the rolling fields and the smell of the fresh grass, but he also gives a title to each individual movement. The first movement is called Awakenings of Pleasant Feelings Upon entering the countryside. The second movement is the scene by the brook. The third movement is the scherzo. It's the, uh, the merry gathering of the country folk, followed by the fourth movement, the thunderstorm, and finally, the fifth movement, the shepherd's song that he plays on his pipe, following the storm, uh, combined with, with feelings of happiness. It's the only Beethoven symphony that has five movements, and as we'll see in a bit, the third, fourth, and fifth movements are all completely connected to each other. This piece was premiered at a very notorious concert. December 22nd, 1808 was Beethoven's Academy Concert, one of, one of many Academy Concerts, but this was a particularly noteworthy evening because it featured not only the premiere of the Sixth Symphony, but also the premiere of the Fifth Symphony in the same concert. If that wasn't enough, the Fourth Piano Concerto and the Choral Fantasy also saw the light of day for the first time in this concert. The program was over four hours long. People made their way there probably on a, a cold, rainy December evening, three days before Christmas. And they would have been entertained, to say the least. It's hard, it's hard to imagine even seeing one work of Beethoven premiered for the first time. But two symphonies, the fourth piano concerto, um, it's, it's, really, it's kind of mind-boggling, actually. There, were all, there was also an ice, or a couple isolated movements from one of his to-be-completed choral works and, uh, and a concert aria as well. Every Beethoven symphony begins in a remarkable way, but this usually means making a pretty strong entrance. So think of Eroica. <laughs> Fifth Symphony. The Sixth Symphony begins in one of the calmest ways imaginable. This first movement is called Awakenings of Pleasant Feelings Upon Entering the Countryside. And you really can hear this here. Beethoven was not known for his ability to get along well with people. And I think that he probably struggled a little bit in the hustle bustle of urban life. So for him, escaping to the countryside and really just leaving all of that behind him must have been a really cathartic experience. He often walked around uh, the woods and around the, the countryside around Vienna and would compose in his head while doing this. So you can hear really this 
almost this exhaling when stepping into the country for the first time. Notice that the lowest information that's being given to us here is a fifth. This is played by the cello and the violas. Some people think that this is an effort to imitate the sound of bagpipes, and this actually happens quite a bit throughout the entire symphony. He also writes a fermata in the fourth movement. A fermata is uh, a symbol that indicates that the music can, can pause for a moment. And now let's step out on our way. Here, Beethoven incorporates the use of minimalism into his music. By minimalism, I mean that he uses uh, a small motive and he repeats it again and again. This one. But he repeats that measure nine times, which is, which is crazy. And what I love about this is that he has four measures of crescendo getting louder, one measure in the middle that's the apex of the overall phrase, and then four measures of diminuendo getting softer. So it's a symmetrical structure. And in that fifth measure, that the, the apex of the arc, he writes for the two bassoons to join the melody. And it's a really a great bassoon moment because they're the only reinforcement to make this, make this, this point that that one measure is really the center of this whole phrase. <laughs> He continues and uses minimalism again in the development. What an amazing passage. It's one idea, but he draws it out over 24 measures, 20, 28 measures by the end when we have the full arrival of Fortissimo. But what an idea. Neither Mozart nor Haydn never would have tried something like this in their, symf in their symphonies. It's thinking of uh, a phrase of music on a much larger scale. And maybe the, the harmony doesn't even have to change that much that we can build longevity in a phrase, that we can, we can make the direction continually moving forward by having this kind of repetition. The music is almost marinating. You become really entrenched in this one harmony. And then all of a sudden we get this. From B flat major to D major, that's completely out of left field. And he's proving here that he can go to any key at any time. When that happens, after the first 12 measures and we get from it feels like the temperature in the room changes immediately and all of a sudden we're going in a slightly different direction. But what else is happening here? This, uh, this repeated motive, it is passed around through different instruments so that is changing in the music and sometimes it's, it doesn't always begin on the same note. But where does this come from? Listen to the very beginning of the movement again. Here. That's the idea. And then he just repeats that again and again and again. This is so typical of Beethoven to take uh, a small element of music, a small motive of the music that's presented near the beginning of the piece and use it to develop the material, develop the narrative of the symphony throughout. I spoke of earlier 
this piece really conveying a sense of solace. And in fact, in this entire first movement, there are only six measures that are in a minor key. And so even here, he starts in G minor, but so soon he can't resist but going back to C major. Here. And then we're back in C major already. The second movement is entitled Zen am Bach, which is seen by the brook. Yes, Bach in German means brook or stream in English. And what Beethoven does here is he, he really does try and give to the listener um, an oral painting of sitting by a brook. So we have most of the strings playing this figure. And then the first violins over top have what's sometimes called the melody, although you could probably make a case that either one is the melody. I love this melody or the part that the first violins play because if you play it by itself, it goes like this. All of that space, which is filled in by the flowing river, Beethoven writes an amazing tempo marking for this piece. He writes andante molto moto, which seems like a bit of a contradiction because andante means at a walking pace. It's, it's on the slower side, but it's not really a slow tempo. It's comfortable with motion to it. So when he adds with molto moto, with a lot of movement, it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit slow, but also continually moving forward. And this actually beautifully captures the idea of, uh, of a flowing body of water because we can sit beside it and it has the, it gives us the impression of serenity and of calmness, but it is constantly moving and it is, it is, a, it is a force. At the end of this movement, one of the most notorious passages occurs in the entire symphony. And this is when Beethoven actually writes in three different bird calls. He doesn't just compose them into the piece, he actually writes in the score. The flute, first of all, plays the nightingale. Then the oboe plays the quail. And two clarinets, both clarinets, playing the cuckoo. So when we have it all together, we get this. And then the strings come back in. The third movement is called Lustige Zusammensein der Landleute, which means the merry gathering of the country folk. And I just love the word Zusammensein, which usually is, tr is translated as gathering, but Zusammensein literally translated means being together. So uh, really a great word there. And this takes the place of the scherzo, which is a fast movement in the middle of a symphony. Usually it's the second or third movement and it's in three, and it always has a light dance-like quality to it. So this is really the party movement. This uh, is where all the country folk are coming together for a merry gathering, 
In modern day, this would probably be called a bush party, but uh, back then, who knows? So it starts like this. It starts in the home key of the symphony, which is F major, but it quickly goes to D major. This is a similar modulation uh, to the other one that we already talked about in the first movement, where we went from B flat major to D major. Here, he goes from F major to D major. It has a, a similar sort of cinematic sound to it, but this is making a modulation by a third. It's a chromatic modulation. I also love how Beethoven writes for the first and second violins to play little grace notes. He's really trying to imitate the sound of fiddle playing here. Just those, those quick notes that bring so much more character to, uh, to this passage. In the accompaniment, he's also doing an interesting thing. The low strings are playing on the downbeat of each measure, each measure, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, while the bassoons play on the third beat, so you get one, two, three, 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 one, two, three. So this movement is a bit of a romp, and uh, it comes to a bit of a startling close because the third, fourth, and fifth movements are completely connected. He writes ataka at the end of the third and fourth, and one scene progresses immediately into the next. So the fourth movement is the thunderstorm, and we have a bit of an abrupt end to, uh, to the party of the country folk. All of a sudden we get this rumble in the low strings and immediately the mood is ominous. Second violins then come in with little raindrops. And we know that something's about to go down. And then of course we feel nature in its full wrath with the arrival of the thunderstorm. So here we have obviously the thunder in the and of course this sounds much better with a full orchestra playing when you can hear the, the symphonic impact of how Beethoven actually wrote it. But we have the thunder which is uh, then followed by the lightning when we have these short bursts. Usually the lightning is supposed to come before the thunder but uh, Beethoven was deaf so maybe, maybe he didn't know. We have in the low strings something really cool happening here. The basses are playing four notes per beat. So we have and then the cellos at the same time are playing five notes per beat. And when you put this together, it sounds like this. You really can't decipher that one group is playing four notes and the other group is playing five. So what Beethoven's trying to do here is he's trying to create a really convincing texture that the, the overall sound that the orchestra makes is so bound together that it gives this impression of the thunderstorm. The rest of the strings are all playing furious tremolo, uh, re repeating, the, repeating the notes really quickly and not, and not measured. But this idea of creating a really busy sounding texture by writing different layers of, ryth of rhythm is exactly how Georgi Ligeti would, would write his music in the 20th century um, with these incredible constructions of, uh, uh, of rhythmic organization. 
But like all storms, eventually it passes and the sun returns to the sky. At this moment, the shepherd sticks his head out of his hut and he sees that the storm has passed and that it's beautiful again outside and he starts to play this tune on his pipe. So we get... And again, we're back at that, uh, that, that warm, cozy character that Beethoven started the symphony in. And notice again that underneath the melody, we have that open fifth. This is played first by the violas and the clarinets playing the melody here. Now the cellos join a, a fifth lower than what the violas were playing and the horn plays the melody. Why I find this so fascinating is just because of these stacked fifths are so strange. You can hear that we want that G to resolve. We either want it to resolve to an A, or to an F. And Beethoven does eventually resolve it to an A, meaning that he's using this as an appoggiatura. It's a dissonance that he's going to resolve to a consonance. So here. But the fact that he stays on this chord for almost four measures, and the fact that the melody is only playing the root and the fifth of the chord, it sounds kind of ambiguous. It's really only one step away from thinking like this. Then you have early Schoenberg. Or if we fill out the chord and make it a dominant ninth chord, then we get the most beloved harmony of French composers of the Impressionist era. But Beethoven uses it as an appoggiatura. So, as you can hear, in this fifth and final movement, Beethoven brings us back to a character more similar to where we started, feeling at ease and comfortable in the surroundings of nature. I'd like to say thank you so much to the Clark family and also to Michael Lipnicki Fine Pianos for letting us sneak in here after hours and capture everything you've just seen. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope that you've enjoyed just a couple of the things that I find fascinating about Beethoven's Sixth Symphony.